This movie talk is about Lost Illusions, a film by director Giannoli based on the famous novel by Balzac. The story tells the adventures of the young poet and writer Lucien, who leaves the French countryside to find fame and success in Paris. The story is set in 1821, during the French Restoration. Let's start. So we're doing this thing in English because of our non-Dutch audience. Maybe it's a bit silly for us to talk English with each other, but we're just going to try if it works. Yes. And we're talking about the Balzac movie, Lost Illusions, that we just saw yesterday. Uh, how should we start this? Well, the novel written by Balzac is about a kind of negative turn that Balzac's own life could have taken. It's a kind of, it's a book about a, an artist who is pursuing his artistic car career, or a writer in this case, like Balzac, but who then doesn't manage to conquer the world in which he is setting out to make his art. Yeah. And, and d thus miserably fails. Yeah. Whereas Balzac in his own real life succeeded. He, he, he started off as a pulp writer lost his illusions, and then afterwards found a way to create a new form of novel writing. Is that how you would describe it? Like if you if you follow the biography that Zweig wrote about him, mm -hmm. then he started out as a pretentious romantic writer, sort of couldn't find his style, then became a pulp writer, found himself and started writing great things. He didn't only find himself, he also found developed his narrative sk his skills um, yeah definitely yeah i i left out the part where he, he he started off as being a romantic ambitious young man yeah uh, but the pulp writing helped him shed his illusions about his own his false illusions illusions about what making art should be and so on mm -hmm. yeah yeah whereas lucien the main character in this book and in this film loses himself in the pulp yeah. And and the success that he has with it. Yeah. Losing yourself in the pool. Uh. I almost have tears in my eyes when I hear these. I'm so sentimental about this subject. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, we it's weird. <laughs> yeah. And and the reason I think that I that this was sort of the main theme for me in this film is because we're also thinking about a way to develop our latest film, Under a Sinking Sun. Yeah. No. And in a way, I think Under... To develop our latest film, what does that mean? To further, to, to sort of do something with it, to complete it. Yeah. To, to another extent. Yeah. And in a way, I think Under a Sinking Sun is also a kind of portrayal of ourselves spiraling out of control into a negative hole that doesn't really convey with our reality right now. Actually, we're, we're optimistic, we have ideas. So we're also dealing with a narrative that is akin to our own fears of our future, but which is not actually realistic or, or doesn't copy reality in the sense that we are in that state, no. this, this desperate state that we, that we show in the film. Yeah. And and I was worried about that. Like, what does that mean? Why are we making a film that doesn't actually ring with the truth for us in a way? So I think this film, watching this film, this Lost Illusions, and thinking about the book as well, mm, is interesting. Yeah, why as an artist would you want to make a film or a book about this alternative reality? Why did we do it? Because I think we're very social artists, like we're very engaged really with society and the world, the reality we live in, the kind of, yeah, the kind of society. And I think we were only ever going to be satisfied with making art if this art in one way or another really centered itself in society or had a relationship, a meaningful relationship with everything that was going on. Mm -hmm. Also politically, um, economically, 
um, not just culturally. Mm -hmm. And our means to do so was to look at this art world and how it is set within a broader context of, of the world. That was our, our way of breaking out of this, the confines of just this, this small art world and, and, the, and the expectations that people have of an artwork now, yeah. these days. And I think uh, that is also why Balzac was so inspiring to us when we were reading this, when we were reading his biography by Zweig and also his work. Because you really see that he managed to do that Be before we were ab able to do that ourselves. I think we were able to incorporate a lot of what we read about and by Balzac into our own work. So Balzac at some point discovered that he wanted to uh, write the Comédie Humaine, that all of his work together would be a, a reflection of society with all its layers and people who are trying to climb the social ladder and people are falling down. Like all the tragedy is social and all the comedy is also very social. And I think that apart from that it was an, a discovery that this is what he wanted to do, I think it is also his learning curve as a writer that he was navigating through society. He, he, w he also had um, other like social ambitions in the sense that he wanted to be an aristocrat. So he, <laughs> he, he was born ba Balzac, but he made it de Balzac and everybody was making fun of him. And he would also dress as an aristocrat and he would go around in, in a wagon uh, as an aristocrat. People would always make fun of that. Yeah. But he, he also used that as, as a persona, and I think he used it to experiment in his interactions with everyone. So the f this Lucien de Rubempré, who is actually someone who fails to navigate all of this and, and has to go back, has to leave Paris, has to go back to the, you know, as, as a country bumpkin that he is, that is someone that against whom he can offset everything that he learned and did right. <clears throat> Even if he made mistakes, he was able to find a solution somehow. Mm -hmm. and, and when I talk about making mistakes, I mean in the sense that his quest was trying to develop an art form that he deemed worthy and that would also have success in the world. Yeah, and sort of survive eternity, yeah? Yeah. Because that's... This film and and also the book creates this polarity between pulp journalism shit that people like to read now and high art literature. This quest for you know really great stuff. Yeah. And as if it's either or. But I think what Balzac did is he in his work this opposition is not there. It's really great stuff, and it also deals with our desire for pulp and temporary art pleasure, pop culture, whatever. Uh, it offers that too. It offers that too, but it's also about this problem in society. Mm. Uh, that's what that's what makes it, in, in my opinion, so yeah, so genius. A vivacious or something, yeah. Yeah, it's incredible because this is such a difficult problem to solve in art yeah yeah because yeah the the kind of the addiction of being in a bubble like this lucien he enters this bubble of journalism in paris in paris and it's so full of life and the people are smart and witty and they they're earning money money is like coming in with bucket in buckets and um everywhere around them like this this life that they feel that they have is sort of also reflected by the theatrical life going on as well and the prostitutes and everything. It's just amazing. Like it's everything you dream of if you... It's a bit this sort of euphoria that uh, Eric Weinstein felt when he felt that he was part of the dark web with Jordan Peterson and everybody and but without sort of the boringness of that group. But this this sort of, wow, we're, we're, we're the, we, we are the elite, we're in the center of the world, we're... Yeah, we're, we're we're making uh, current stuff that's sort of, yeah. Uh, Balzac knows how to sort of portray 
this feeling of yeah. when, when you when when you are part of this bubble yeah. and every everything feels relevant and you feel invincible invincible yeah 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 so uh, this this real making that or showing the attraction of that that really is there yeah for people and then at the same time um the cruelty of a world like that if you're not able to conquer it yeah in what sense is it cruel well in that it's so well it punishes every kind of um it it's very cruel to people who do not properly perceive their own worth within that world if they overestimate themselves is that what's cruel about it? I think what's cruel about it is is that that this world is very demanding on uh, what kind of person you should be, on, on what things you. It's it's very demanding on what you shouldn't try to achieve in this bubble. So, like, be a real writer in this case. Yeah, for example. Like in this enthusiasm that he finds himself in Paris as a young writer. That becomes then becomes a pulp journalist. Uh, there is no place for this um, romantic high quest for art. Not in a real sense. Of course, there are writers that are being seen as such. Racine, for example, uh, Voltaire. You know. Yeah, like the greats. The great, the great writers of this times. Like you also have the great artists now. But I think Balzac feels that this is that these artists are. Yeah, not real avant-garde, not real, not not really connected to uh, to uh, already sort of repeating a certain image of art that we have and sort of fetishizing that and be be becoming anachronistic in a sense. Yeah, I think they're also from they're older. They're like mm -hmm. in the film, they're already yeah uh, historical yeah of course figures yeah yeah yeah, and there are also people writing at that time literature great literature but they sort of copy the styles and elements from these older older uh, generations that are seen as great literature yeah i think the central theme in the movie from this perspective is what is integrity yeah. what is genuineness and what is lying in art yeah and of course pulp and journalism and fake news is about lying and a perception and the reality and the truth in that how how people are are animals that that do this stuff and i think in becoming a pulp writer balzac really learned about this uh so he he he, he, he threw away all this sort of romantic bullshit and he became sort of this hyper realist also in the fake news element and in the uh, romantic elements as well uh, how well his his novels have romantic uh, twists and turns, in, in the plot especially, but in a really kind of, in a way that reflects the reality of those romantic notions within uh, yeah. human life. So as a desire. Yeah, I think in that way it's a little bit like pulp fiction, yeah. where Quentin Tarantino sort of shows you what kind of pulp we enjoy. Yeah. And and there's a consciousness in that and then takes it to another level. But I think the reason why Balzac is more interesting to me is because he, he's, a, he's also a fool, an idiot himself that sort of believes also in these, in, these, in these ideas. That's also why he dresses up like an aristocrat and people laugh at him, but he still does it. He's really vulnerable in, in a sense and very sort of unsuccessful in navigating this very strategically in real life. I mean, he was super successful, but he also had, had a lot of problems in society as a writer. He was not accepted as a writer. He always had money problems, like lots of things. Yeah, he earned huge amounts of money. He lost huge amounts of money. Yeah. And he never was admitted to the Academy yeah. uh, of Writers in France. And so this sort of this thing that, 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 that the madman and the genius are very close to each other, that's absolutely true for this, for this Balzac figure. Yeah, and it also shows that it's not just like that. It's a line that is be that, that that shouldn't be crossed. It's a line that that has to be crossed, 
by the genius. And that is this sort of game of projection because then in the books, if you read the books, it's so super self-aware and reflective on all this madness. That's crazy. So it's about you have to you have to have been there in the craziness to look at it. Um, yeah. But where were you? I was I was sort of going into this. Well, you I think you started off with saying that this film is about genuineness and integrity, and also the how this how this relates to things like fake news and human nature. Yeah. Which always produces that those kinds of vortexes of yeah uh. yeah i mean uh, that, that's also what you see now in 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 sort of in 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 art the sort of desire for solemnness and, and holiness and you know kanye west dressing up in black you know from a superstar like kanye west dressing in black and being sort of very modern mo modernist and holy in a way to let's say all this all, all this bad uh, literature that is being propagated by in the Guardian or the New York Times. Yeah, you recognize a taste for reverence. Like art has to be reverence, but it, people also have to feel reverence for it. And um, it's also quite clear how you will, how you can sort of compose your artwork to to emanate this this sense mm -hmm. of reverence. Yeah. Uh, and the subjects that you need to be reverent of. Yeah. Yeah. And how this 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 reverence is currently attached to modernism, eh? like the the Mondrian specialist in our Mondrian uh, Kirak episode says to you, you have to be reverent of Mondrian. You have to open yourself for it. You have to like, submit. Yeah, submit like a like a like a monk does to to God or something. And I think the same the same desire for reverence for art you see in Kanye West uh, in his sort of uh, Jesus God complex and the, and the sort of pure simplicity simplicity that he now sort of searches in this last Donda album and the aesthetics and and um, I think when culture turns to this sort of hyper reverence this decadence uh, it is sort of ready for a new form of art. It's, it's 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 like a ripe fruit that is about to fall off, and then you will enter a phase of 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 new realism. Eh? I mean, it happened with the modernists. It happened with Balzac in this sort of uh, blah blah era of Paris, uh, where you had the reverent literature at, the, at, at on the one side and the pulp journalism on the other side. Where you had the conflict between uh, the royalists and the liberalists. Um. Yeah, so you could say that um, politically, people are rather disenchanted with the world. They've seen things which make it impossible for them to look at the world in the same way, like the Iraq war, um, what happened with Trump and. This is this this has created a new kind of awareness amongst people, and and it has also divided p people into those who, who uh, choose not to see this and those who cannot unsee this. Yeah. Um, and and at the same time, you have this set, this this very I think very uh, ubiquitous desire for meaning and uh, genuineness. And I think someone like Kanye West really also is searching for that or thinks he he has found it in this kind of modernist uh, reverence, which he offsets against the meaninglessness of uh, the industry that he, he had to work his way through. Um, and also offsets against the meaninglessness of... Uh, this political whirlpool of lies and um, um, ambition. Uh, yeah, I'm just also against the whirlpool of his own bipolar creative mind. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a centering of of everything. Force. Yeah, um, but it, because it, I don't. Th well, for me, it doesn't do the same thing. It, it shows me the desire which I share, but it doesn't offer me 
uh, it doesn't give me what I desire. So there's still this urgency for us and other artists to, to sort of marry this desire for something that is centered and true with the reality of this whirlpool, uh, the political, uh, the vortex of, of disinformation, etc., and the way in which media works. And I mean, the way in which people create lies and truths and whatever. Yeah, not making your art high by simplifying it or making it sober, but by creating beauty in this in this entire complexity of yeah. life. Yeah. And and the cynicism and the hypocrisy and also all integrated into this work. Not try to make the work purer than the world it is offsetting. Yeah. Yeah. But these are sort of all the sort of themes that were browsing through our heads while whilst watching these movies. These are the these are our quests as artists in this world. This is the riddle that we want to solve. Um, now that we've uh, displayed these themes, these uh, these topics, should we start brainstorming now, or should, what should we do? Well, there. I could either really try to answer your question or I could grab a few things that I was thinking but that I kept to myself while you were talking. Oh, I want to hear those. Um, There's one of those is that I was thinking someone else who did that, who made an artwork about a, a negative outcome of her own art quest, was Lena Dunham. She made girls uh, about a young woman who eventually fails to become an artist and ends up with a baby that she has to take care of. And you don't know it's going to, whether it's going to work out or not. Whereas on the, in, the, in real life, you had Lena Dunham. Uh, the superstar. The superstar. Really, like, really, at that time, I think this was 2012 until, well, at least until 2015, she was really this this star. She rose with this series, Girls, and it was amazing. Like I, I watched, I binge watched everything, and I thought it was great. And it is great. And it is great. The first seasons are great. Before she enters the woke trap. Yeah, and I think that's that's interesting because it show. I think it's also a a version of what can happen to someone who is a social artist. So she was really navigating art in this same social way. Like Balzac? Like Balzac, but also like we are doing. in Like looking at the things that people think around you and their 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 social and political ideas and sort of... Um, uh, using those as subjects for your own artwork. Yeah. But then she was sort of uh, developing this, this new art, this art form in... In a world that that really drastically changed in those few years, um, and she was too early. Like she really mis misstepped. She really she she went on into this woke ideology. She fell for it, and she she felt that she had to adjust to it, and and with that, really sort of destroyed everything that she did, everything that she discovered. How did she destroy it? What was the quality that? That that her f series or films had before she fell in the trap and after. I think they felt very genuine. I mean, even I mean, they were obviously about someone who was very privileged, and people would throw that at her as a as a critique of her work. Mm -hmm. But she was very privileged, and yeah. there is this very privileged reality in New York: young people um, who have parents who are also artists and who are but who are building this kind of Babylon of. Of 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 uh, Woody Allen esque uh, art or something. Yeah. Um. And she was adding something to that that was also new. Also, it, w it was really a feminine perspective. It, I had never seen something like that before. Even Sex in the City was nothing like it. it that was really about those milfs who are working hard so that was really not my reality but this was really also about me and my sexual insecurities and desires and whatever and also my desire to manifest myself 
Whereas in, in Sex in the City, they've already all manifested themselves. Uh, the money is literally falling because it's the 90s. And it's a glamour series. Yeah. And Lena so, Dunham was portraying this this world of uh, endless internships, living in this very privileged environment, but at the si same time, there's zero opportunities. You know, this weird paradox that in Babylon, people are are eating each other and cannibalizing. And yeah, and 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 the way friendships look look when you when you when you're from a class where all your friends have been to college and they all have these ambitions, and then at a certain point, you start to you start. You have to break away from them, or define your relationship in a new way, because otherwise, you're going to keep each other very small. Um, so people were calling that privileged and dismissing it because of that. But, but I think the quality was that it was very genuine. Also, her, her, her. You know, her, the way in which she uses her body and um, the the narcissism that is related to not in any way. Um, uh, being like the beauty ideal of the 20th century, not 21st yeah, an ugly century. Yeah, narcissist like Woody Allen, but then yeah. in, a, in, a, in a female body. Yeah, this was very interesting. Yeah, yes, yeah, so that was really great. Yeah, and um, and that that's what broke. Like this this genuineness, it disappeared. Yeah, it was destroyed. And how, and how did it get destroyed? Did she start to feel beautiful because people told her so, or like what well, what happened? Yeah, maybe maybe that is an aspect is that whereas the first few series she would just pose these themes and the way she saw it and she wouldn't have tried to prove that it was also true trying to put a lid on it whereas I think as the, as the series progressed there was there was also always this element of that it was not only the way she saw it but it's also the way it is for all women or for all peop young people, it became stagnant. Yeah. Yeah, and and from this sort of super realism that she that she achieved, which what made yeah, which was what made it great, it became yeah like a fake LGBT fairy tale about social justice. Yeah, and it's it, it's really not a problem if an artist has outrageous views about either themselves or others. As long as because it's 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 delicious to look at outrageous views, like it's 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 entertaining and it's nice. And if someone does it very very well, uh, that's part of the artwork. But if you try to sort of, if you're in a way, if you become aware and ashamed of that outrageousness, and you try to under put you know to to park it within something that is accepted, sort of masking it with uh, political ideology then it just be it becomes monstrous it bec but it also becomes very boring yeah monstrous sounds good huh yeah 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 monstrous sound po sounds positive actually for a work of art. but yeah and the other th the other fact is just that she hasn't made i think she's bringing out a few things now but this is seven years later she hasn't made anything anymore yeah. uh, she's been ill but i think I think that's that's only part of an, of the explanation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's someone who really fell in between the 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 gap between this gap that she was bridging herself. Well, it must have been so hard for her to squeeze these first seasons into the world with all the pain and 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 all the, I mean the pain that it that it causes to make these realist things that then she became famous and successful and she started to relax and uh yeah and with it probably also became the sickness and the self-loathing again and all these things maybe she will, maybe she will make a beautiful thing in 10 years about about the complacency of uh, of her success yeah, and it be, and 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 make this great work of 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 the woke trap. Yeah, uh, the woke bubble actually, because it's a social it's a social trap. Which is like the journalism bubble. Yeah. In the film that we I saw. I think she has the intelligence and the integrity to do it. No. Yeah. And then her falling into this trap for ten or more years is actually interesting because I, I think she's pretty deep in it. 
yeah. Yeah. I would want to watch that series. Like, not a series about a girl trying to make it in New York, who's smart and ugly, but a series about what happens when you become a star and you enter this Hollywood bubble. It's not probably not a Hollywood bubble, but some sort of success bubble. I don't really know what the, you know, topography of that is but in the States, but... We go back to talking about the film we've watched. There's, there's nothing exceptional about the film. No. It's not a film that I would have wanted to make. No. But it has its heart in the right place. Yeah. And it's not stupid. And it's not stupid and it's uh, it's very hard to make a film, I think, from a, from a book that is so elaborate and i think it it did it did a really good job at selecting key like the key elements to make a good film yeah a good a good watchable entertaining film yeah but it doesn't really effectively uh, make this it is about this this sort of universal quest of the artist to find an art form and to be genuine. Um, but I think in, indeed, like it doesn't like Amadeus does, make that make make you feel that universal weight or so or something of of the subject. Well, I think it does, but it's sort of weird that the film itself doesn't seem to have this ambition. Mm-hmm. You know, that's weird. Yeah. In the way that Amadeus by Milos Forman abuses this fake narrative of Salieri killing Mozart in order to to yeah, get this this essence of, 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 of the jealousy a mediocre person feels towards the genius. It's sort of interesting because this jealousy towards the genius is actually not so much felt by mediocre people. You have to, you need this desire for for art and meaning to feel this jealousy. In a way, in everybody who feels this 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 jealousy, uh, there is a potential artist inside. You know, Salieri wasn't uh, wasn't that talented in making uh, making music, and maybe he wasn't that talented at all. But he 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 shared a a desire for art with Mozart, and not with the rest of the world, per se. And this sort of weird paradoxical uh, f- thing is very interesting about this film. Like, what is the place of the desire for art in people? Most people don't give a shit about art. They care about pulp. So and, and, and entertainment and Twitter and bubbles and, and logocentric thinking and you know and information and blah 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 blah. Um so where this movie sort of I mean and now I'm talking about the Bazak movie again, where the Bazak movie I think the main drive in this in this Bazak movie was the the opposition between uh, pulp journalism on one side and high art on the other side. This was the this was the drama axis, the contrast. But it was of course Bazak who integrated this 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 pulp into himself in order to become this great eternal writer. Um, so in a way the proposition of the film the philosophy of the film is not completely accurate I mean it's true that Balzac also yeah uses abuses the, this fake opposite in his book I'm talking about the fake opposition between pulp and high art but it's part of many other sort of uh, Contrast he throws he throws in the air, uh, but it's not. I don't think it's the essence of the book, and I think the essence of the book is 
deep psychology. And like I'm rereading it now and the way Balzac introduces the the aristocratic woman that falls in love with him and that uh, that takes him to Paris. Madame de Bargeton. Her psychology like and the and the reason why she abandons him and why she falls in love with him in the first place are so well yeah, sort of analyzed in the book. Like why this woman, this sort of aristocrat woman, why why she became interested in poetry in the first place, what her desire for poetry is, and what then is her desire for for this for this Lucien, the main character in the book. Um so he really sh- he re- in this book he 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 researches or or he he uh he shows you how people how some people need art very much mm-hmm. and this movie doesn't do that like these things are all in the movie these things are all clichés or givens or given you have people who like high art and this is like this and then people who are cynical pulp writers say high art is snobby bullshit or something. Yeah, you have royalists and you have liberalists. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 one of the critiques that the writer Balzac often gets is that he that he yeah is that he deals in these cliches in these in these opposites. But 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 then what he does afterwards is sort of he goes behind the stereotypes. He uses the stereotypes to set you know, and and then he he creates a depth. And I think this is very difficult to do in movies, to start with a stereotype and then make it very nuanced. And I think this is this is one of our ambitions with our films, that we that we start with these sort of, yeah, these stupid blocks, you know, the fight against cancel culture and the importance of it woke people uh se- you know like like we use these things but we sort of like like we, we find ways to immediately go into the sort of the the uh, where it goes beyond the stereotype and the politics mm-hmm. by immediately making it hyper personal but that's also why our films are often i think misunderstood or not understood by people why are you showing this to me whereas this films this successful Balzac films film really deals in these cliches and puts them like blocks and really like like a well-structured script and everybody can understand it everybody who has, who has some sort of cultural background in the west um if you're 20 or 60 you will you will understand this film and that's why it's a good film also but so i understand if you make a film you need a certain simplification or a very simple you know thing to 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 make it work for 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 an audience but to compare, I think Amadeus does this much better because this sort of this setup with the Salieri and the jealous Salieri and the murderer is a much more uh, simple and at the same time complex way of of of, of getting a- immediately to the essence and then building this film upon that. Yeah. So that's what I think about the film. What was your favorite scene? Well. I think there are two characters that I really like is the director of the pulp newspaper, this cunning character that in the end um gives Lucien the death blow at the end. Because I've I've met this guy, you know, so often now that we that we are dealing with finding money and blah 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 blah. This this sort of uh high level strategical thinker. Yeah? Yeah, I think like when you're young and you discover cynicism and 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 being successful in media you become sort of entranced by this new cynicism oh i can write pulp and successful and now i just say this opinion and then i will get so many likes on my tweet and then next week i'll say something else and you you're you're sort of uh, happy with this discovery but then there's a layer above that where somebody looks at that and looks at all these young people writing uh contrary opinions and it's not so much surprised anymore by this dynamic and looks at it from with a certain wisdom about the world and with empathy i think to 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 his own position and all these other positions that's what i really liked about the film but you have the feeling that you've met this person but have you actually well elements of this person and other persons Hmm. i think everybody who who's in business 
in a successful way as this. Yeah. A sort of senior, a sort of senior, uh, yeah, seniorness. Yeah. And second, of course, was Gerard Depardieu as the um, publisher. And he's just such a fantastic actor. Eh? I mean, when he tells him, uh, you, you learn quickly and you're a hypocrite. And like, he, he, he tells him all these things in, 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 in one scene. What he does with his face, like all the sort of emulations of emotions and real emotions and, you know, like this sort of, yeah. And also so relaxed. Eh? So relaxed. So laid back in his... Yeah, but at the same time, letting his relax is not uh, relax, relax, relaxation not become phlegmatic or stand in the way of enjoying looking at the, the person in front of him. That's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, what an actor. You know, like really next level, so, sort of. Yeah, and I think the film would have been much more successful if you if you. Build it around Gerard Depardieu or the printer, and look from this perspective. Like, like switch the whole perspective of the book around. Yeah, yeah. Like Salieri, like like in Amadeus, he did it. Emilius Forman did it with Salieri. Yeah, you, you don't actually get to see Mozart that much. No, and you shouldn't. No. You know, because that's how we look at artists from the outside. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's beautiful. This Gerard Depardieu printer, who, who, yeah, who, who sometimes has to publish poetry because otherwise he's not a serious publisher, but he's not making any money off of it. It's like my spy spikers, you know. Also happily tells us, yeah, of course I do this this shitty philosophy book, you know. But it's just, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, for the legitimacy. The pu publisher, my spikers in Amsterdam, yeah. Yeah, it's true. You actually you need the the seniority, the life experience, the relaxation of um, the, the the businessman who is who has a relationship with the artist, the brilliant artist. Yeah. To portray the brilliance of the artist. Well, I mean, unless I think you have a brilliant actor. To play the artist. Well, I mean, no, you can do it in many ways. I think that the, the, the greatness of, of the way Salieri is being used in Amadeus is that you see this pathetic madman still longing for this great art. And you see the ridiculousness of the art desire. The ridiculousness of the desire to make great art. The pathos in this old crappy man that still longs for being a great artist like, like people dream when they're 16. And this is, of course, such a such a such a beautiful way of, of of showing the pathos of the desire for art. But there's also this 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 indeed this this warm sort of senior, cynical, slightly cynical perspective that the publisher has in the Bozak film. Mm -hmm. Like all these things are sort of very interesting and and and, and could be a potential uh, basis for a movie about a genius. Perspective. Yeah. yeah. Because that's, I think that's what you're struggling with if you make a film about uh, about 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 Balzac or Beethoven or Mozart. Beethoven also, the, the Beethoven film is also not not good. No, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah, or the Goya film, also by Milos Forman. So Milos Forman also owes a lot to this theater maker who wrote the script. Yeah. Who gave him the script for the Amadeus film? Yeah. So it's also as if Milos Forman didn't understand himself what made Amadeus that good. Which I think is super weird. Mm. You know what I mean? Like he, he made all these terrible movies about geniuses afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> After Amadeus. I didn't see those, I think. No. Well, we, we, we checked out the Goya film and then switched it over. Oh, yeah, 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 now I remember. No. That. Yeah, it was bad. Yeah. Because it's also you also have this film with Nell and I, yeah, which is also about a about a undiscovered genius in a way, yeah, it's like w with Nell, who's being looked at by his not so genius but or less extravagant but maybe also genius friend, in a way. No, I mean with Nell is the sort of um, is let's say. The pure artist, like maybe Tarek Saduma is also an arch archetype in the Kirak. And then the I, Whitney and I, is the 
Is the I. Is the Odessa house. The Stefan Ruitenbeek who puts in a lot of work and then a lot of editing and a lot of shit uh, in order to use this muse, this character, and make it into a sort of stable art artwork. Yeah. This film that you're looking at. Again, we try to return to the main topic, the actual film we've watched. But I feel like I've already forgotten what it was like. I watched it yesterday, I was crying, I was super moved, but now I totally forgot, I forgot about it. Yeah? Yeah. I don't know what to talk about relating to this movie. It's a very well-structured, well-balanced sort of entertaining movie. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you were also touched by uh, Coralie? Coralie, the prostitute girlfriend of the main character, Lucien who is played by a charming and chubby Salome de Vals. Are they actors? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's nice that she's uh, a little bit fat, huh? <laughs> That's cute, don't you think? Mm-hmm. Like, if this movie was made, would have been made in the Harvey Weinstein era, she would have been this sort of, uh, a little bit like a model or, or Penelope Cruz or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But now they're really, they yeah, they really selected a, a little chubby prost- prostitute. Coralie. And then she dies of lung disease. Also, this kind of stuff could have been a little bit more dramatic. You know, come on. Yeah. She just dies and then they close her eyes. It's a, You know what I mean? Like, the, the, the movie is a little bit wary of making its hands dirty. Mm-hmm. You know, like showing scenes that might not work or that a little bit, like... That are, Over the top. I mean, before we went, you already told me the, the film probably doesn't have the sense of humor that Bazak does. And then I was watching it and I, fo- and I was laughing at some points and it was funny, but it is lacking this this frivolousness that makes Bazak so, so good, you know? This allowing this, all this bullshit in, you know, all this stuff. Yeah, because I remember like in one of his books, Nicht Bette, Cousin Bet, yeah. it ends with people who have sort of made other people's lives miserable for the past few years as a kind of revenge you know they 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 sort of rot away because they are given a amazonian poison and they literally rot away in their beds and it's wholly un unrealistic but it's it's yeah it's like you said this kind of frivolous revenge thing well there's this the superpower in being this very realistic writer that knows how to really show the world and psychologies as how they are. And then sometimes completely, you know, stepping away from this script and just doing things for the pleasure of, of doing it in the book. Like again, Quinn Tarantino does at the end of uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. You know, fuck it. When he starts shooting the girls. Yeah, and in a way, Balzac... I mean, he also wrote a book about modernism and abstract painting, like a joking book about how painting will evolve into super abstraction. He was the first guy to theorize about this. The masterpiece. The masterpiece is called. But whatever, uh, he he is sort of he, he yeah, he's such a postmodernist in all these things, and he does all these things, and it's 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 so much fun. And nothing of this was in the film. It was a very serious, well-produced, well-brainstormed, well-balanced film. Well-paced. Well-paced. Everything at the same pace. A little bit boring at times. You know. Um, It was a boomer movie. You know. Boomers can go to this film and think, ah, yeah, Balzac was a timeless writer. And it lives on. And it lives on. So now I'm happy. Now I can also die. You know? Yeah. And I think the reason why Balzac will live on is because he inspires new makers, new storytellers. Because it's so 
endlessly endlessly new all the time what he does. Yeah. I was also re- reading this interview with a Dutch writer, this idiot, Philip Huff. And he says, oh, all this talk about Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, I don't see the relevance of that. Uh, but I think that's the... Re- like, you talk about art living on forever and the artist making stuff so it can live on forever. But it only lives forever if other artists are inspired by by it. Great artists get inspired by it. Great young new artists steal from it. That's what, you know, and a Philip Huff book will of course never do that. That's why it's so obscene that he's saying these things. Uh, because he's selling pulp disguised as uh, lit- literature. But I think, but to me this is interesting, that this notion of high literature that is also being uh, ridiculized in the film itself, and it's also a notion that Balzac himself suffered from and that he had to abandon by becoming a pulp writer and writing in, and finding a new perspective. Because art will always deteriorate uh, because of because of its timeliness. I mean, if you read a Balzac, you have to be interested in French society in this time. Yeah. If you're not interested in the art of writing, you have to be interested in this element. But if you're an artist, you're looking right through all these sort of specific cultural things and you're looking at the structure... And you see what he's doing and you see all these possibilities for you to make art. So th- I think this is the timelessness of art. How it's structured, how it's formed, how it's made. Um, and other artists suck from that and they use it. And it sort of helps the artwork survive more than the fact that it was written in a certain time or period that is inspiring for current times. Because otherwise the artwork is always dependent on on the other whether a period is relevant for the now. I mean, of course, the Greeks and the Romans are always relevant for European and American culture because we base our whole identity on on stemming from them, you know. So, so Homer and Caesar are read the, uh, because of this reason. But if this vanishes, the thing that will remain is sort of the storytelling devices that Homer uses. Yeah. And uh, yeah, nothing of that is in the film. And I think this is also a little bit the, a symptom of the disease that is currently there in the, in, the, in, the, in the movie world. Is that, yeah, the film world doesn't seem particularly interested in these matters. Hmm. Uh, this film could only have been made because somebody pitched to make a movie about a French national hero. You know, that's why it was made. Not because the French national hero is so inspiring, on because of, because of this or this reason. Yeah. That's what you feel a little bit, you know. Because Balzac wasn't accepted in his time, you know. We already said this, but he he wasn't allowed in the in the academy. People hated him. He was he was cancelled. Um, this film should have some of these qualities in itself as well. I mean, this film is so perfectly acceptable. You mean it should have, in its form, it should have been more avant-garde. Yeah, it should be unacceptable. Like, like people should watch this movie and feel the same disgust as the people in the time of Balzac felt when they saw Balzac walking around in an aristoc- aristocratic fake outfit. Like, how dare you pretend to be an aristocrat? Or how dare you do this podcast in English, in your broken English? Why? Because you want an international audience, which you don't have. You know what I mean? Like this, these sort of angers mm-hmm. that the public feels towards the same shamelessness of the artist. These are very important, and none of that is in the in the in the film. I mean, a little bit. You know, when he when he when he reads his first poem to the people, um, he's he's they don't understand him. You know, but but yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And um, it's not true what I'm saying because I think Amadeus is a great success and it was a very well accepted film. Well, it ha- it does have more transgressions in it. Yeah, like it's very, the, yeah. The laughter of Mozart. 
yeah. Like hit hit the f- the sort of sort of um, off putting weird part of him, and also his sexuality, and how he manages to sort of get get all these opera singers. Well, in I think the funny thing is, like I just said, the public should have been shocked by the film. But I think what the, what what Milos Forman or the scriptwriter of that film did very smartly was actually abuse the genius himself Mozart for this. Like they really made a travesty of Mozart himself. But they made a great film about the problem of a genius. Uh, so they so they put all this banality on Mozart. So actually, only sort of Mozart purists would have been angry with the film. Like he wasn't a fiend like that. Da 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 da. And and this Balzac film does neither of this, Nos, nor does it ridiculize Lucienne, the main character, who is sort of like a stand-in for Balzac. Nor does it uh, make the public feel blasphemized. It does none of these things. And then there's this very smart little role for Gerard Depardieu, probably a small role because uh, he doesn't want to act uh, for for too long, you know, because he doesn't have the energy to do an entire film. But he's there, so oh, the Depardieu is in it. Let's go to the film. But there's no sort of disgusting, uh, vile, you know, 18th century or 19th century uh, Gerard Depardieu in there. You know, like 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 in Danton. Like in Danton, you know, the the other film where he where where Gerard Depardieu acts. Yeah. So it's yeah. Um. Yeah, and I'm not saying this because I think the film should emulate the art of Balzac or something, but it just makes it a little bit boring. Yeah. Yeah, what else should we discuss? (sighs) And we are trying to do it in English, or poor broken English, because, yeah, we still have like 30-40% non-Dutch audience. And please let us know if it's terrible, bearable. bearable. If it is unbearable, we will simply do it in Dutch and accept that we can't, you know, afford a subtitler to do all these podcasts. And we will just have a very limited Dutch audience <laughs> for these things. <laughs> and we will, and then we will just translate our movies, subtitle our movies. Yeah. In the hope of ever escaping this, this this horrible place, Holland. This horrible little country. This horrible little country. Oh. Oh yeah, because that's also a big theme in the film. The province and the place where it actually happens, Paris, and us being stuck in this fucking, you know, Amsterdam, provincial, fuck place. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and it's not even romantic and beautiful like Angoulême. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Oh, hey. What do you think about this matter? This this element of of wanting to go to the place where, you know, where 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 you're really being put to the test. If I can make it here, you know, there. Some things are best felt, not said. Are you saying, telling, telling, hey, talk to me? No, I don't know. Yeah, what, no, what can I say? I think it's a very interesting team because this assumes that there is this central place where things are really hot and happening. And this is completely demolished now, right? Yeah, because I think we were talking about Lena Dunham aired, uh, earlier. Yeah, Babylon. And uh, I think we've also discussed this in our Jordan Wolfson episode. How new, the New York... Let, let's say the Jordan Wolf episode is called uh, The Latent Potency of Rob Tavares. Yes, episode yeah. 20. Yeah, it's gone. Um, we discussed this place in the form of New York, or New York as it was in the time of Andy Warhol. As this place where you want to be. Yeah, and um, that still had a a shimmer of that until recently, but I think... You don't want to go to New York? No. I think so, man. Yeah, you do? Yeah. 
I think your audience is bigger. I think there's much the the the, the food. I mean, of course, it's still much better. You know. Um, of course, it's much better, but it's also what I'm what I'm trying to say is not, maybe not that I wouldn't want to go there, but that it doesn't have that ring to it anymore as it used to. No, of course, a new city, a new culture will develop, and it will be probably in Asia or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not about that it doesn't have that ring to it anymore. I think it's about that everything sort of function in, functions in a, in a in a global context now. Yeah. You know. Also, because our f- sense of nationalism and local language is completely gone. I think if you talk to USA people, you still find that blissful shimmer of ignorance, you know? Like that it only it only matters what happens here in the States and the rest is just, you know? They still believe in this. I was talking to these people from the States on this barbecue and you feel that actually they... Yeah, the rest is just exotic or, you know? Mm-hmm. Foreign language, movies or whatever. But I think also for them this idea is dying. Yeah, so maybe it's just an archetype that 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 Balzac could use. Yeah. You mean the the. Because it was sort of very relevant at the the time. Yeah. Yeah, and also of course because you had the aristocracy, which was based in rural France, and then would go, come to Paris, and then would have to adapt to yeah. city life and. And, and and all the possibilities that a city offers for people who are not from the upper class to to rise. Yeah, also that the that the, that the aristocracy in the rural places uh, didn't like the king because the king was competing with the provincial aristocracy. Mm-hmm. And these sort of things. Yeah. Um, things eternally will remain and be better in the countryside. This idea is also very present in the in the Balzac book. Mm-hmm. Some things will, will not, you know, like suffer from uh, cosmopolitan whims and fashions. Uh, and therefore it's also in a way sad or something. There's a sadness to it. Yeah. That 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 the countryside never has this vivre. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't know, but maybe it's also my age, like being 40 or becoming 40, is that I wouldn't know a place in the world where I would want to be, where I long to be. Like laying in my bed, being 16, dreaming of going to New York and then, or Amsterdam, you know. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it was because I was 16 then, but I also feel completely lost all its sort of relevance in the world today. And it's not because of the internet. I mean, of course, it is because of the internet and the globalization, but uh, it's because there. Are, I don't think there are any places that at least pretend, uh, like they did in Paris, that they are trying to achieve the highest form of culture. Mm-hmm. You know, like Andy Warhol was doing when he was competing with the abstract, uh, abstract expressionists. <laughs> Like, it's all just cynicism, and you can only have this city, this place where you want to be, if this golden calf or whatever whatever it is, you know, is 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 there. Yeah, that's also, yeah, what you saw in the movie, is how these, how the city is alive, and how you have quarters where which are dedicated solely to theater, and quarters that are dedicated solely to journalism, yeah. publishers, prostitution... The nijverheid, the 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 workmanship, the work, well, the bedrijvigheid, nijverheid, the busyness of the people, the business of the people drives uh, the architecture, the mm-hmm. the way the city looks. But it still does, so I don't get it. Does it though? Yeah, you, if you, now you walk around, you see the coffee company and see, seeing people behind windows with their laptops. That's their business. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. No, I think I think it's it's true what I'm saying. The aspiration of the city is gone. Yeah. People are happy if they sort of make it, if they find sort of a stable income. 
that they're safe. You know what I mean? If they have a podcast, you know, that works and that and that gets them financed and you know, so they can make babies. Yeah. You know? But this there there must be this 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 highest point of the pyramid. For it to be exciting. Yeah, for it to yeah. Because it's all just cynicism. If I read New York Art Critique, the art center of the world, but also London, whatever, like in, wherever in the world, it's all cynicism. Yeah. Yeah. Like if I read Art Critique that is written in New York now, it feels like I'm reading the the university uh, mocking paper in Amsterdam. It's the same. Like Propria Curis, um, the Dutch, you know, uh, Satir- satirical. university satirical paper has the same sort of seriousness as as art writing by Dean Kissick or you know in in New York there's yeah there's nothing to be to be gained there yeah uh Kanye West is the greatest artist alive because he's a billionaire you know what i mean it's all just practical and hyper relativation. So, I think therein lies the opportunity of the province, you know, like of 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 Holland, of of the countryside, of living in a place that's not relevant, that's just a vassal country, of other bigger countries, because we still have this romantic notion of great art. Of something fantastic that can elevate elevate you, because we are anachronistic. We're 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 backwards. Yeah. We're not we're not caught up in this sort of weird, pragmatic, boring survival mode that everybody's in. But that's not in. true. I think it's true. We still live in this weird social welfare state. There's much less pressure on us, and also much less commercial opportunity, in a way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Health care costs are you know like all these things yeah uh, life is simpler rents are lower and i think this is also what you see in this in this balzac story that he lays out is that there is this naivety to aspiring great art from the moment that you start aspiring it because you are 16, because you actually don't know what you're talking about, but you feel something is there. There's a belief. And then you enter this world and you and you see that you're being naive and it's stupid. And then once, once one response is just to enter the pulp and the cynicism and use your intelligence to become a king in this field. But then there's this thing that through this you can still you can you can still find something that has to do with this dream when you were 16. This and this is something that doesn't happen in the film, but does happen in the book, is that in the end of the film, this writer de- decides to write down the story of Lucienne. But what is being omitted there is that this book has these qualities of pulp and high art merged into one. Whereas in the film, it's this sort of like, a little bit like kitschy royalist writer that will then write it down. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, this is a, this is very unrealistic. Yeah. Because Balzac, of course, <laughs> you know, like he's he became the Matrix. You know what I mean? Like he really did it. Yeah. Uh, and that's why it's so fucking alluring, this Balzac figure, because he solved what, this this most complex puzzle. Yeah. The film doesn't deal with the problem of kitsch and versus avant-garde and versus um, proper taste in a very intelligent way. Whereas I think this is the this is one of the main themes of Balzac. Yeah. 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 It's a very important theme because this is how people navigate in power structures, via these codes and via ways of of um, breaking these codes. You know, you break the code, you make avant-garde, you go a step higher. Yeah. True. Yeah. You. Also, when when they use qualifications to well, to qualify or either disqualify a work of art in the film, um, it's all within this realm of uh, tone. Is the tone right or not? 
I don't even know what it means. Yeah, because because it's fashion. It's, it's that that is something that is dictated by fashion. Yeah. And none of it is about meaning, the, the qualification. Yeah. And uh, I think so, so people who are not really artists working for newspapers know exactly what is being said when they said, "Ah, you got the tone right." Yeah. But if you're an artist yourself, like I am, you actually never really know what they're talking about with tone because somehow you have a blind spot for these things. There's always this ridiculous, unfashionable side of you. That's why often artists are weird, weirdly dressed and not in a fashionable way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Balzac never learned how to write in the fashion of the time or to get the tone right. Yeah. He learned how to engage. Yeah, and I think this is something that we... Uh, we're still struggling to get people to look at our work beyond the tone. Yeah. This is this is something that's very hard in this time, and I think that we have that in common with uh, Balzac in his time. Like yeah. this, there's the same kind of. Balzac was writing in the time after Napoleon, when uh, when the royal uh, family was back in charge of France, and people just wanted to go back to to normal or something, and 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 we have the same kind of like it, our our prime minister in Holland also talks about just do my normal just just act normal this is the kind of mentality yeah. um, and even if you don't like being normal or you don't want to be normal you generally are annoyed by people who don't behave normally because we're all in un, in the same position we're all in the same boat having to act normal so anyone who doesn't act normal is, is just it's just ruining ruining it for everyone. Yeah, omitting his responsibility. Yeah, and if you're going to make art about that, you're 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 inherently going to uh, brush people in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. But you really wish that there were a, like a that people would sort of hark back to some kind of literary tradition in which you would be. If you if you talk about film, if you talk about art or, or literature, you also talk about this notion of having to break conventions and uh, and disgust people in order to be able to make something new or make something that is about the reality you live in. Well, I think I mean I think uh, yeah, like. Every real avant-garde, not like the cliché avant-garde of the 20th century, but like real boundary-pushing artists has this problem. But the path that Balzac had was literature, which was this tradition in France. Yeah. And I think when we developed Kirak, we realized that we couldn't use literature or contemporary art as a genre to fit in because the, these are already totally corrupted these 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 genres mediums these mediums uh, in the way they are being perceived and being talked about uh, as well as alternative movies or independent films so we chose criticism because nobody actually knows what it is we call ourselves art critics which is purely about the idea that, that purely about the idea that being critical is always good that you should always be allowed to criticize art it has this weird populist possibility, uh, you know, of this of destroying art and therefore doing what the people want, like away with all the snobby bullshit that costs money. Uh, so we chose this, but now we have the problem that nobody looks at our work, except for our fans, as art or as films. Uh, like we are sort of trapped in our own ploy ploy or decoy or whatever we used yeah alibi to make art which is sort of funny and now we're trying to be smart by doing this movie podcast so we can slowly enter you know like 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 change the percep perception but maybe yeah it, it would be interesting to talk about this this little comedy or tragedy that that we have bestowed upon ourselves uh yeah from a from a philosophical perspective eh? Like, like apparently in this time where everything is so banal and capitalist, you need you need to call yourself art critic in order to make art. 
you cannot just call yourself um, um, a filmmaker or or contemporary artist uh, because then you fall into the category of art dealers and Stefan Simkovic's and you know like or Gagosian or you mean you fall into their hands you fall into their hands but also into the expe- expectations that you should somehow make some something that they can sell or that a, a movie producer can sell like this Bazak movie it's completely fitted into what we think is film right now there's nothing avant-garde in the movie itself and it's fine it's entertaining but it's boring it's it's not any more interesting than the book and it's less interesting mm. so you cannot simplify a book by Bazak into a movie uh, now, you, you can only simplify a book if you want to make it into a movie. But what you can do is ma- is do something in the movie that you cannot do in the book. You know, like uh, Milos Forman did with Amadeus. I think that's it. Are we, we going to stop the podcast? Stop the movie talk? Stop this fake thing that we're doing? No. I mean, I thought that was a... That at least, and anyway, it could be an ending. Uh, you're you're on a roll, so maybe. Why are you looking for endings? Sorry, I'm I thinking of ending things. That's also weird eh, that the Charlie Kaufman all, all of a sudden makes these makes a shit like such a shitty movie. Yeah, I didn't. Did we see it or we saw part of it? No, eh? we stopped it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, such a terribly shitty movie. Not like a weaker movie like uh, the Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which yeah. is just him being romantic. You know, but. But like really Did he make Eternal Sunshine of Spotless Mind? Yeah, and he and he and he wrote John Malkovich and being John Malkovich and adaptation. You know, an adaptation is not as good as being John Malkovich, but it's a very good film. Yeah, and uh Synecdoche was really good. Synecdoche is, is a work of genius. Uh, I want to watch that thing again, I think. Yeah. But it's yeah, it's weird. It's it's as if Andy Kaufman became his own assistant and Made thought an Andy thought he, he had to make an Andy Kaufman film. Yeah. Where and and trying to make it Andy Kaufman in all the decisions such as the casting, and the setting and the, the camera, the camera, and everything except the dialogue, or something. Yeah, I don't everything know. except the genius. Yeah. Yeah, it's really weird. But maybe he's just really depressed. Well, I think it, it is. It is. It's very typical for this time that you see artists just being destroyed by success. No, not success, but there. There's a pre-Trump and a post-Trump era in art making. <laughs> like, yeah. like there was no good satire during when Trump was in office, when he was during the elections, and uh, and and after it. Uh, that was like a, a literal black hole of satire. Yeah. Um, but you all, but and and then also other artists fell into that hole, like they didn't make the make the cross the abyss. Yeah. Yeah. Is it then that their sort of liberalism was so fundamental to their? Possibility to make art. Also, that's also nice about Balzac, eh? that he was a royalist. And he sort of, in a way, deliberately chose the backwards thing to choose from. Like, yeah, like sort of an artist should always take sort of the, the backwards political view or the the wrong political view or the impossible. It, it, it sort of makes things a little bit better for the artist. Well, it's all, I think it has to do also with him um, wanting access to this higher class. Like he also wanted to marry this Miss. Um, of course, no. I mean, he needed Hanska. aristocracy because it was very important in that time, and he wa- it was his trauma that he wasn't aristocratic. Blah blah blah. That's all. That's of course all true. It's very opportunistic for him. That being said, you know, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't a strategical choice, being a royalist, but it's it, it was good that he was. Well, I'm not just saying that it was strategical and that he would have felt it as strategical entirely. Uh, I've noticed myself that when you're 
when you're talking with people who uh, who, f who fund your work, you you have a friendship with them and you become so emotionally invested in their position. You mean people who donate more than two euros a month? Yeah, for instance, um, Philip and Inge van der Herk, yeah. who are also the subject of a few films. Mm -hmm. You become so emotionally invested in their position, which it, and it feels as a friendship, a genuine friendship, and their position is by definition a position from which it is impossible to see what is below you when it comes to means, because you just don't know what it is to have less money. Whereas we can enter their house and we can see their way of living and we can also aspire to it. They they would never aspire to something that to be is, poor. Yeah. So there's also no 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 genuine uh, sentiment interest. and interest with which you could place yourself in that position. I mean, if rich people do that, then it becomes like the little garden of Marie Antoinette or Stefan Simkiewicz. They can only hope for us to become rich. Yeah. And hopefully not with their money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so when you are in their houses you also get a, a feeling of love for their stuff and their their lives and the way in which they do things so nicely for themselves. It almost feels like you you can feel gratitude for for being able to see that and feel that for them. It's a kind of love. And this also makes you feel like you need to adapt some of their ideas. It's like good taste. It feels like a like you're honoring that friendship by adapting some of their ideas. Yeah. And I think that this Balzac's ro royalism would have been something like that. Like honoring this this this, this his ability to em empathize with people who were who have more than he has and who have uh, the possibility to lend him something that he needs to become this artist. He doesn't want them, he doesn't want to be them, and he doesn't want them to give him everything. But he he loves them because they have the potential to make something possible that he thinks is is, is the, the ultimate thing. Which is? Art. Yeah. Great art. And also to be... Is that true, by the way? Maybe also not just art, but to, to find happiness in doing it as well. To not kill yourself in the process because you're only working. The aristocratic way of living, I mean. Yeah, to also to like, the joy of the aristocracy. The, the, yeah, the joy of of creating something like the deep uh, existential pleasure. fulfillment and pleasure, combined with yeah, actually being rewarded with a kind of heaven to be able to languish in 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 doing nothing and being as aristocratic or something. Yeah, because giving birth to an art piece hurts like hell. Yeah. And then when it works, it's the best thing ever and you would immediately abandon all your money or all your safety at that moment for that feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what you would abandon. So that's sort of like the opposite of that. Like wealth and comfort and luxury. and uh? Yeah. Like, like I, I don't think artists are natural spenders because they're impulsive per se, but because because they know the feeling of of being very content with yourself and luxury and and just eternal bliss. <laughs> eternal bliss, yeah. they're 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 comfortable with that feeling. Uh, yeah, so they so they so they yeah so luxury comes natural to them. Yeah, and this is also why, the, as an artist, you can feel on par with someone who's wealthy. Yeah. Because you can sometimes feel entirely unburdened. Yeah, by when your you're own, making this thing. By your own financial worries, and etc. That's also why, you know, you, you remember this Korean film which had the Cannes uh, Award, the Palme d'Or, a few years ago, I think. Parasite. Parasites, yeah. Or Parasite. I think you, this film was about that kind of love that you can feel for the life of another. If, if you're poor, you cherish the things... Of a, if you clean the house of a wealthy person, you cherish those things as well. Yeah, you're not necessarily uh, uh, rancunous, how do you say it in English? Yeah, you're not... A angry to them for being rich. Or jealous. or. Yeah. But then, of course, um, the filmmaker uses that love in a horror. To, he turns it into something that's horrific. Because it can. Because it can, and that is also... If it is, if this relationship is purely materialistic, 
as it is when you're the cl- if you're an employer of someone. Yeah. Then it can become horror, and I think that that was very. I, th- I like that movie, um, but I think maybe this is a bit off topic. But what we're dealing now with, and what we have dealt with before, also with our um, mecenases, but what we're dealing now with Inga and Philip is that they they constantly feel this sort of sort of horrific turn in which we become envious of them and, yeah. ma- and malicious. But do you know why this is? Because because of the last two films we made, the Sid film, the Honeypot film, and Under Sinking Sun, they no longer see us as artists, but sort of weird neo uh, reality TV pulp makers. Yeah. So they no longer feel as if we are their equals. Now we are only those poor bums. Yeah. So that, all of a sudden they let out their claws and start biting on them. Or yeah, because that's the only thing that bums can do. Can do because you're no longer on equal terms when it comes to the to the wealth that you possess in the form of art and they possess in the form of uh, money. And that's also why it took a very un- ugly turn the last time that we went on a trip with them because I couldn't stand that that they no longer saw me as artist and started only talking about yeah practical stuff um, I saw myself as an artist so it was also not absolutely not uh, on par with my self image yeah and I also I'm too proud to, defi- to to defend myself at this point towards them because I I feel I have this relationship with them so I shouldn't have to be you know explaining myself in that sense mm-hmm. yeah this is very interesting this is very interesting. Also, this also has to do with the fact that we call ourselves art critics. Eh? So, with every film, we have to prove that it's actually an artwork. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, and also, we want we want it like that because that way we sort of secure for ourselves that we're not making fake literature. You know, like all these young writers do. It's called literature, but it's not. It's sort of like a long. It's sort of like a long read in the New York Times or the Guardian or something. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. This problem. Yeah. I think we we got ourselves like with the last shooting we did. I think this is gonna be released in a year. It's gonna take a long time to make this film. Yeah. I think it's yeah. I think it's fantastic. We're so good. <laughs> we somehow found this way to like expose every sort of cultural problem. And, and and sublimated. Yeah, it's like these beautiful um, devices that that have been made. I think maybe in Africa or something to detonate mines. Yeah. Like for these r- round bowl bowl like structures, bowl mm-hmm. like stru- that roll and then k- jump up if they detonate. Yeah. The problem is that we are operating these things and we are we are on top of these things. Eh? <laughs> yeah. So we don't have a remote yet. Yeah. We're always on this on this bowl. Yeah. 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 Getting detonated. <laughs> but what doesn't kill you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. You 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 were talking about adopting their ideas. Like if you walk around in this in this in this Philip Inge house, you 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 become a royalist yourself. You take you take some of their ideas. Yeah. And I would like to ask you what are the ideas that Balzac adopted? from aristocracy and what are what are the ideas that you adopted from let's say yeah entrepreneurs or you know okay i will i will also try to answer the question straightforwardly but i think what i was trying to do was i was also trying to uh, pinpoint the, the the type of adopting that you do with those ideas. No, that that I completely yeah. understood. That's why I didn't ask it whilst you were saying it. Because yeah. I would have ruined that. Okay, maybe you want to talk about the type of adopting a little bit more. Well, we made the Simkovic film in which we really lay bare this the whole psychological intricacy of his love for um, people who are not well off like he is. Yeah. People, his own, his 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 maid, 
Oscar Murillo, whose parents were maids and, and who come from an Colombia, artist. and he became an artist. Um, and we, yeah, uh, and this this um, Marie Antoinette Little Garden in Versailles was a way to understand the the the, the maybe this this typical uh, love that you can have as an aristocrat for rural, simple life. Good people. Good people. Um, and even even though I, if I look at that, I see the. I see the complex, and I, I I could never adopt that feeling, but even with him, I I had that sense of accepting that view of the world because I was sympathetic towards him, and I it it took on the form of me at least not really wanting to challenge that in his face. Also, because you don't care about the politics of it and and whether it's realistic or not, yeah. Because it's his psychology, and it's also. A fact of life, everybody that gets rich at some point gets these nostalgic feelings for the uncorrupted simplicity of poverty. Yeah. So it's sort of like if you want to, even if you want to, would want to create more equality or more progression in the world, you, you sort of ha have to deal with the fact that once you become rich, you start to become, you know, decadent in, your, in, a, in a sort of Marie Antoinette kind of way. Yeah. So, like, why would you want to challenge him? Because if he then all of a sudden has this great insight and sees that it's nostalgic bullshit, then the world would change? No. Yeah, so you don't want to sit across him and start rubbing... And discuss him. Yeah, sort of rubbing that in his face. Like, the good thing about being able to make a portrait of someone is that it's only a good portrait, even for the person himself, if you really attempt to show this person. Yeah. And that is how this sort of analysis of him and also the flaw of his philosophy maybe yeah um could be a a beautiful a beautiful sort of red line red in 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 the film yeah uh so that is that is sort of what happens when you deal with people who who potentially uh, can support you as an artist or mean something to you as an artist because they they have wealth. Mm -hmm. And then which ideas did I adopt? Well, okay, yeah, I think with Balzac, if you read the biography by Zweig and you read some of the letters that he wrote to Miss H um, Hanska, an aristocrat in Poland who he would eventually marry because her much older husband would die and he would... I mean, he spent his whole life trying to convince her to marry him. <laughs> uh, and then eventually she came to Paris and he would die within a year or so. It, the most awful death. He, would, he was all purple. He had a purple tongue hanging out of his mouth. And he died sitting up? He died sitting up. His friend saw him and the whole house was full of stench. And, like, it, it's a com complete tragedy. He died his own novel. Like, it was... And it, it has to do with him not being able to let go the idea that he has to somehow be also be unburdened of financial stress and material stress. Um, and that maybe this Mevrouw Hanska, this Lady Hanska could offer him that. Where she was never able to truly grasp his genius. Or at least, maybe this is also slightly the perspective of Zweig, who is jealous of Mrs. Ha of Mrs. Hanska, and who tries to make her a lesser person than she maybe really was? Stefan Zweig, the biographer of Bazaar, yeah. is is jealous with the because Stefan Zweig, the biographer, of course, understands understands Balzac much better than any aristocrat Ever. Balzac would want to marry. Yeah, because Stefan Zweig is an artist. Is an artist, and but Stefan Zweig is also. Um, a Jewish uh, bourgeois comes from a bourgeois Jewish Jewish family in Vienna. After the aristocracy has sort of crumbled, and the bourgeois in Vienna takes over the responsibility of of culture in the city, and then of course Stefan Zweig. It's a very sad. It's a very sad complex of of relationships. This whole thing. Zweig, Balzac, and the yeah, yeah, because Zweig has this huge love of art, and he looks up to artists and 
but he is a he's a real craftsman in a way himself. He writes these biographies which are amazing to read. Um, and he is like um, Salieri in a way when he writes about Balzac. Because he he would never be able to write an oeuvre that is as brilliant as that of Balzac's, to make a to make an invention that is as brilliant. Not But he is close. able to see it and he can come close, and it's a tr it's a joy to read the the biography. I I don't think anybody could write a better biography than Zweig. You think that he comes close? Uh, well, it's such, but it's just a whole other. Yeah, he chose another it, it, genre. Yeah, he chose another genre, but it. It is his role to look up, in a way. And he looks up to someone, Balzac, who is able to to make a much greater fool out of himself and to be much more brilliant at the same time. But Zweig himself wrote this book of Balzac at the time that he had fled Europe because his Vienna and his Europe had been torn apart by the Second World War and all, of, all his relatives and friends had been killed and right after finishing the biography of Balzac he killed himself and his lover also it's incredible eh? in Brazil yeah and it's just so understandable why because Zweig I think the reason that he could write these biographies was because he was a real embodiment but also a real promulgator of democratic values, European values, European rather than uh, Austrian nationalist or uh, German or Jewish for that matter. Yeah. And he saw that as the the basis or the, the, the necessary grounds from which he would also make his own art as a as a citizen of Europe. And he sang about, like in his works, he sang about the value of art and the value of... As a pillar on which democracy and a better world is founded? Yeah. And of course, Balzac is one of one of the creators of a new form of art. Realist art. Realist art, which is very, it's, it's true, it's a very fundamental part of democratic society to be able to to cast a ruthless eye on society and all the layers and without becoming um, immediately activist about it. Ruthless Ida was destroyed by the fascists with their anti anti art attitude. Yeah, and and so in completing this work of art, I think um, Zweig felt that it, that all the pillars were just gone. And I, he, think that's psychology I don't know if that maybe maybe I'm no no don't worry no no I'm I'm not ashamed because you maybe comp get it completely wrong, and it's probably very I mean, maybe we should do more research in it because it's actually a very interesting question like why did he kill himself yeah I mean was it just being overwhelmed by the reality of the Holocaust and the terror of it and almost being ashamed of being alive yourself whilst all your friends are killed. Yeah, maybe to also not being able to bear the idea that you have to start a new work in this world where, in in a Brazil where you're living, where where none of the the threads, the 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 the, the, the matter on which you based everything your whole life is there. There's no. But is it really? I mean, like a a, a king would rather put his head in the guillotine than to lose his being a king, his power. His position in society. Is this also the case for a convinced, I don't know, Democrat? You know, like that w when you start living in a fascist society or a post Holocaust society, you don't want to live in that world anymore because you lose your position. Like, I, I don't really get it. Like, I, it's not like, I mean, he wrote, he wrote about it to Mary Stewart. Mary Stewart would rather die than give up her, 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 her sovereignty as a, as a, as a, as a queen. Yeah. I I mean this I mean he wrote this book I'm saying this because I wrote the, because I read this book that's where I get this idea or this fascination like he has this fascination now I have it like for how how aristocracy went to the guillotine and how they carried themselves yeah like he had a great fascination for this like for their weird pride and the way they would do their makeup before they went and like all these things this was very fascinating to him 
like dying in your like the desire of people to desire to die um wearing your armor but also um the desire the impossibility of people to imagine themselves in a world that is that is different like the uh, i think jordan peterson sort of gave a sort of evolutionary version of this with the crab theory that if you get defeated your identity gets destroyed you really become smaller your brains deteriorate and you become a smaller uh, crab or i don't know what what a, what a lobster the lobster theory yeah um s something like this happens also maybe not as physical as with lobster but also psychologically with people uh, I mean, it made people want to write things like poetry is dead after after Holocaust, no poetry anymore, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but I'm wandering off a little bit. Like, I want to get closer to this, to the relationship between writing this biography about Balzac in these times. You know, Stefan Zweig writing a biography about Balzac in this fascist period. Period. Well, maybe yeah. I don't know. If you read the the world of yesterday, I don't know what the the world of yesterday. I couldn't read it. I I didn't like it at all. No, I I didn't like it that much either. But I did read it, and I it was very. It does tell you a lot about him, and the way he enjoys life, and also the way he makes his art. Mm -hmm. It's it's very. Yeah, he he travels around Europe constantly, visiting friends other writers yeah and he enjoys being with them and talking about art with them and it's it's a it's a life that's full of life in a way and it's uh very modern also like kind of eu uh, that he takes these trains everywhere and so on a citizen of the world a citizen of the world and i can imagine that if all of this comes to this screeching halt and you're stowed away in brazil somewhere and you have no friends and and it's hot. This, and it's <laughs> yeah, it's it's tropical and um, it's very different from what you're used to. And you know, also know that this world that you fled doesn't even exist anymore. I don't know. It's I think it's very hard to imagine that it would rebuild itself also. And if it didn't rebuild itself, because all the Jews in Vienna were killed. Um, yeah, and then you're writing this book about this Paris and Balzac and what he did with it. And then you... And you're old? And you're old, you're in, I don't know, he was in his 60s or 70s, I don't know. Yeah, then... And maybe you're a little bit vain. Maybe he wanted to die in a heroic way. Yeah. Because... Balzac didn't feel this uh, political activism when he wrote these books. He was much more absolved with himself and his position and, 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 and his psychological insights into other people that he used sort of for, for his adventures. Whereas Balzac, Balzac's weight is based on this activism and, and the importance of, of, of enlightenment and culture and all these things. So maybe he wanted to put like a, he wanted to give that some weight by by showing that you also want to die for the for this for this image or something, yeah. Well, like where where do you get your conclusion that Zweig is vain in his personality type? Yeah, I th well, the, I I gather that from yeah. There's a Dutch word is fatterig, a bit of fat and fat. Snobby. Dandy. Dandy. -ish. Um, but Balzac was dandyish, but he was not vain at all. No, but Balzac was not dandyish. He no, he it was, was not, absurd. He was absurd, yeah. Whereas but with Zweig, you get the sense that he was very particular about the, the type of gloves that he would wear and the tasteful and um, not exert yourself too much and um, this lifestyle was very important to him. Not the content as much as the style. Um, you know? So weird. Traveling. Because he wrote these books and they're very psychological. They don't have the psychological finesse Balzac carries in his books. Well, he needs a kind of morality always to... to, to Every page there's a moral... 
yeah. thing. And he's aware of that flaw, but he ha- he needs how, it. How is he aware of that? Because how he d- sometimes also uh, apo- apologizes for it or something. I how, don't know. how does he do it? When? Where? Well, maybe I'm making this up. I don't I know. I think so. I think I think that's what amazes me. Like his deep interest in amoral, beyond good and evil Machiavellian characters, mm-hmm. and then talking about good and evil as if you, yeah, that, that's. I mean, you really have to look through this flaw if you want to enjoy his books, because otherwise you get so annoyed. Yeah. But I mean, it's 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 a flaw, so you can look through it. But yeah, it's 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 in a way not fundamental to the quality of the book. Yeah. Because it's a tool. It's a yeah, it's a tool of story writing. But also of trying to understand w- this person. He's but it's a lazy tool. So if he wouldn't have this flaw and would have somehow found a more intelligent way of structuring his stories, the books would have been much better. Uh, uh, yeah, and they're already pretty good. Yeah. 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 So there is something small-minded or vain or something in him. Uh, which he recognizes at least to the extent that he has chosen an art form in which he looks at other people. Other artists, other politicians, other creators. Who are, are, in a way, uh, well, not all of them are are greater than he is. No, well, he's very keen on saying that uh, before he starts writing, before he starts in the introduction of the Marie Antoinette book, he says... This is a book about a about a mediocre person. Yeah. He also says something like that about Mary Stewart. Yeah. That she is that she has greatness, but it was only in two years of her life. Uh, you know, like this. He has he has a sort of obsession with this. Yeah, and Balzac is f- f- wholly great. Something. Thank you for listening. See you next time.